So next we're going to go into a global attribute that I use literally every day at work and it goes by the name of P scale. And in order to illustrate what P scale is, I'm first going to have to create a point. So if I create an add sop, add sops are just it creates multiple points or connects points with polygons. For this instance, I'm just going to create one point. And you can see it right there. Then I'm going to create a point wrangle. Then we're going to take this point and put it off origin. So I'm going to do at p equals 0, 1, 0. And now it's up in space. And so what p scale is, is it means point scale. So the scale of that point. In the viewport, it just looks like a dot over a grid. And it's just a representation for a position in space, but we can use p scale to change the, sc the, the scale of this. Obviously, <laughs> it, it is p scale. So first things first, we're going to do at p scale equals one. And again, even though this is a float, I don't have to declare that it's a float because it's a global variable. Houdini knows what p-scale is. Attribute p-scale is reserved. You do not need to declare anything. So we can't really tell anything about p-scale right now. All we can see down here is that in the geometry spreadsheet we have a scale of 1. But what does that really mean? So what we're going to do is we're going to create... We're going to go over to the out context and create a mantra ROP. And I always go into here and go to candidate objects and delete star, which just has every object in your scene rendering. And uh, I don't know why it's a default, but that's just what they have. I want to de decide what I'm going to be rendering, so I'm going to go to Geo1, accept that. And then another fun tip uh, is if you go up to lights and camera in the shelf, uh, let's say you want the camera exactly where your viewport is just zoom in where you want it so I want it here and then hit control click and it'll create a camera in the position that you are and now I don't have to position it in space uh, translating it and rotating it in awkward ways I can just use the viewport so I have my camera I have my ROP and so now let's go to render view up at this tab and we're going to hit render and see what we get. So you can see here that that one point that I had in space uh, with a p scale of one is gigantic. So let's go back in here. We're going to dive into geo and p scale instead I think I'm going to make point one. And if you look at that, it's now 10 times smaller. And we'll make it even smaller now. 01. And so what it does is Houdini, if you just have a point, you can choose different ways in which to render that point. And the ways to do that is in the geometry object, you can go into render. And then in geometry, we have right here, it says render points as. And right now, we've decided to render it as spheres. Uh, so default, it will just create a sphere on your point. You can also do circles. And circle is just a flat disk. It does accept light. It is a flat plane, whereas spheres are spheres and receive light in a way that you would expect a sphere to. Uh, another thing is that you can set point scale in the geometry. You don't want to do that though. You want to have control over the scale and this is just sort of a global scale that you can choose but very rarely do you want to have all your points be the same scale so you aren't really going to use this at all. So uh, forget you even saw it, you're not going to use it. 
So we're gonna dive back into here. And so yeah, we got P scale, it's at 0 0.01. One thing about it though, is it's gonna be really annoying to constantly be having to go in here and change the scale by typing it in this line of code. So one thing that you will be using a lot as an artist is you're going to create your own channels. So uh, let's say I don't want this to, I don't want this line of code to be evaluated anymore. So if you use forward slashes, it's going to comment it out and you're not gonna, it's not gonna evaluate. So now what we're gonna do is at P scale equals CHF and then use parentheses, put in a semicolon, and in here, this is where you name your channel. And so CHF means I'm making a channel and F means that it's a float. And again, that means that it is a decimal value number. So let's say I'm just gonna name this scale. So doing that, it gets me nothing. Uh, and the reason for that is that when I create this, it default, defaults to zero and you can't see my channel. And so in order to create the channel, you have to go over to the right and this right here, it creates the parameters. So if I hit that, boom. Now I can see the parameter that I made and it's again defaulted to zero. So I'm going to do 0.01 and I can just slide this however I want it to be. And now I don't have to go into the code at all to change it. So let's just get a better visual of what we're doing now. I had an add, but let's get more points. So instead of just using one point, I'm going to create a grid. And let's just give it 50 by 50. And I'm gonna to wanna to reposition my camera. So if you go up to this drop down, you can choose your camera and then this lock right here, if you click on that, that locks the camera to how you dolly in the viewport. So I'm just gonna zoom this on back. And have a good view of my scene. Uh, so now that we have the whole grid displayed, we're going to scatter points on top of it. All right, so now we have our points. And we are going to take this point wrangle and plug it in here. Uh, we aren't going to need to change the position right now, so I'm going to get rid of that and get rid of that. Uh, and just to make this a little bit more visually interesting, I'm going to drop a mountain sop, which just adds some noise to the surface. I'll change the height a little bit, maybe the element size a bit, just for fun. So now, if we put our viewer onto this, look through the camera, uh, if we go to our render view, hit render, We can see all of our points and they all have a P scale of 0 0.5 or 0 0.05. Uh, and so that's all cool. We're manipulating the size of the points. But like I was saying before, we rarely want all of our points to be the same size. So there's gotta be a way to manipulate it so that each of them has a random size. So in order to do that, we are going to disregard what we have here and instead we're going to do at p scale equals rand which is a random function which gives you a random number between 0 and 1 and we're going to base it off of the point number so each point that is on that grid has a different number assigned to it just so that you can reference it later and say hey I want to do something to point I don't know 55 and so since each point has a different point number, that's going to be basically the seed, the way that this function evaluates how to give it a random number. So I'm going to do at 
ptnum, ptnum being the point number. So if I do that, so it is giving me random number, but those numbers are pretty big. So zero to one, you saw before one circle or a point at one is, is too big. We, we don't want it to get that high ever. So what we need to do is we need to take this number a random number between zero and one, and we need to fit it so that instead of it being from zero to one, maybe we want it to be from, I don't know, 0.01 to 0.03. So the way to do that is we use a fit function. And so there are two ways to do a fit function. First, we're gonna do fit. And so we want to fit this random number here. And so right now the random number, random number is from zero to one, but instead we want it to be from point 0, 0.01 to 0, 0. 0.03. And there you have it. We have no point scale from 0. 0.01 to 0. 0.03. However, there is an easier way to do it. When we use a fit function, the first two numbers are the is the range of numbers that we want to change. Usually you only use a fit when you know that the range is not going to be from point or from 0 to 1 but if you know that it's going to be from 0 to 1 for example if you're using a, a rand function and a rand will always give you 0 to 1 uh, you'll do a fit 0 1 which just automatically assumes that it's going to be 0 to 1 and makes it so you don't have to type extra stuff and so as you can see it works just as the other one did only with less typing which is great but again, I don't really want to have to go in and type stuff all the time. I don't want to have to go into this code. So we're going to do what we did with the previous way to set scale. So I'm going to change this. So I'm going to make a channel float. And I'm going to make a minimum number that it's going to be. And then in here, I'm going to make it a maximum. And so again, it's going to default to zero. So then I need to make these. And now let's do a one. And just for a better example, I'm, I'll make this 075. So now we have a, ver a variety of scale from 0 0.01 to 0 0.075. And I can scale it up as I want, scale it down. And I don't have to go into the code anymore. And so if you look at this, it's not complex code at all. It At first glance, it might look like it is, but it's really not. And this function here, I use literally daily. I type this so much that I, I can probably type this faster than I can type my own name. But luckily, one thing that Houdini has uh, is the ability to save snippets of code in Wrangles, especially for times that you're going to be typing this all the time. You don't need to have to type it every time you drop down a point wrangle. So what you can do is if you go up to this gear, you can go and you can do save preset. And so I've already done that. So I already have made P scale down here. So let me just delete this. And then if I'd go point wrangle, I'll go up to the gear, I'll hit P scale, and boom, it creates the code. And now I can change this up. Oh, and then one thing that I had done before, and is actually, I'll go into this now because it's actually kind of important. You can see in this code, the reason that this isn't working as expected right now is that my seed in the code that I saved before is at ID. And so ID is not a thing that Houdini creates for you, but it will recognize it when it exists. So the main reason to use ID is when you're going to be deleting points down the line, or if points decide to die, if you're emitting from uh, a particle sim, PT num is a randomly assigned number. And anytime one point dies, that number is reassigned to a different one. And it randomly shifts the numbers to the point where you can't use them to 
keep a consistent P scale, for example, because the way that you assign the P scale is through PT num, and if PT num changes, then P scale will change. So it's really important to keep your seed consistent, and to keep it consistent, before you delete anything, you assign an ID to it that won't ever change, even if the PT num does. So we're going to do that here. So after the scatter, I'm going to drop point wrangle and just declare at ID equals at PT num. So that's just saying that my ID, and if we look in the geometry spreadsheet down at the bottom, it does correspond with the PT num. But no matter what, when I delete points, the PT num will change, but the ID will stay the same. And that way we can use that for a seed here in P scale. So now if I re-render this, you can see now that my point scale is randomized by ID. And just to give you an idea of what I mean, whenever I say that PT num changing will change, the seed in which the random function works. I'm going to go back to PT num. And so then what I will do is up here after the scatter, I'm going to do a blast. And let's say I just blast uh, one thing that I'm going to do just to make this easier. So I'm going to drop a null. And this is something that you should get in the habit of. If you do out render, you can see that there is a blue flag or a blue circle for uh, where your viewer flag is, and then there's purple for where your render flag is. If you hit control and then click on this viewer flag portion of the null, it's going to put the render flag there. Uh, Oh yeah, and so right now I'm blasting everything out. <laughs> uh, and I don't want that. So let's say I just want to blast uh, points uh, 5 through 20. All right, so I've deleted points. And then this is what the P scale looks like in a random distribution. But let's say I want to delete points 1 through 20. Now, everything is different. All the points have been reassigned to different, or all the PT num values have been assigned to different points. And so if I delete random things, I get a random seed. And I don't want that. However, even though I've deleted these points, I'm going to put ID above the deletion. I'm going to put that here. So you can see ID is declared above the blast. So now if I change this to 1 to 20, and so then I also have to go in here and change this back to ID. Now when I delete things, it shouldn't change the distribution of P scale. So if I do 5 to 25, well, 5 to 25, you can see that points are deleted. But even though they're deleted, it's not changing anything else. So as I was saying before, it's pretty good to declare an ID as, P as PT num before you delete things to not change your seed. However, you don't really need to do it if you're not going to delete anything. So while it is good practice to use ID as your random seed, you don't really have to. I just do it in case I'm going to be deleting things. So there's another thing that you can do. It's redistributing the P scale along a ramp. And this is really good for, let's say you want a lot of things that are small and then only some things are big so that it's not just a perfectly random distribution. Because right now, with the way that this random function works is you have 10% at 0.1, 10% of it is going to be at 0.9, 10% at 0.5. It's all evenly distributed, but let's say we don't want it to be evenly distributed. So what we're going to do is we're going to make a ramp. 
And so what this ramp is going to do is take my random function and change how it's being distributed. So I'm going to do inside here, chi channel and then ramp. So I am now making a ramp channel. And so the first thing that you need to do is name the ramp. So I'm just going to call it ramp. <laughs> and then you need to give it the attribute that you want to redistribute. And in this case, it's this random number that I'm getting from ID. So I'm just going to close that out. So now you can see that I'm fitting <laughs> this ramp. And this ramp is redistributing this random ID. So nothing's going to happen right now because I have not actually created the ramp. So we want to make this channel. So now we have a ramp and it's distributed from 0 to 1 in a perfectly straight line. So this ramp now takes that 0 to 1 value and redistributes it. So we can say uh, anything that's at 1 stays at 1. But anything that has a value of 9, now we want this to go so that they actually have a value of 4. And then this ramp kind of does that for everything else. So anything that had a value of 0.8 now has a value of point, I don't know, 3.5. And so this is just now changing the values however you see fit. And really the a good way to use this is when you just don't want a perfectly even distribution of stuff. And as you can see now, you have a lot of big ones, a lot of small ones, and all the in-betweens aren't really there. But then you could go and be like, all right, well, anything that's really small, I want to be really big now. And you can just play with it however you want. Uh, and this is really good for particle emission, so we're gonna, we'll get back to this one later, but this one's just a, a really simple way to make a ramp, because the other way to do it, you can go to a point VOP, and then you can do and you can bind the p scale attribute and then you would have to go to a create a ramp ramp parameter and then you can fit that ramp So you'd have to change this from RGB color ramp to a spline ramp. And then you'd have to bind export this out again as P scale. So now if you go up here, you can do the same thing that you were doing here, just with a lot more effort. So uh, just in general, I try to keep as much stuff that I do in VEX as possible, just because it's very quick to create, very quick to edit. I don't have to dive down into anything, so I don't have to go in here and do anything. So it's just uh, it's more convenient. And then another thing that is, uh, is interesting to see. So point VOPs, it's all node-based, but what it does is it exports VEX in the same way that you see it in a point wrangle. So actually, if you go onto this node, right click it, you can go to VEX VOP options and go to view VEX code. And so then this pops up all the code that's actually being run through this. And it creates a lot of spare parameters, but in doing so, if you go down here, this is the code that it's creating, which if you're ever kind of curious on how to recreate something from a point VOP uh, in VEX, you can create anything you want in here and then it'll output it in this code and you can just take a look at it and see what it's doing. It, it is always going to be a little bit more complicated just in the way that it generates the code automatically. 
because it has to take into account a lot of factors, but it will give you the basic idea of how to create VEX. So yeah, point VOPs are just VEX. It's just node-based to give you a visual indication of what you're doing.